pray, I have the confidence to know that God is listening to me. And Jesus even spoke of this, Matthew 7, 7 says, Ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened to you. There's a confidence even in that. Jesus is saying, ask me. Do it. You don't need to chant like everybody else is chanting. You don't need to be wishfully thinking that, somebody's, that God's going to come through for you. No, you can ask with a confidence because God hears us when we call on him. So I get the privilege of sharing with you. Um, and and well, I want to start with this is to let everybody know, and especially Marlboro, um, we've been studying the commands of Jesus. And the reason we've been doing that is because there's this interesting passage at the end of Matthew, Matthew 28, where Jesus says, when you go out into the world, when you go and do these things, teach them everything that I commanded. And so we're t using that as a jumping off point uh, for what we've been studying. And we've been talking about all kinds of different things uh, regarding the commands of Jesus. But today... We read from Matthew 6, 5 to 15. And there's an interesting command that Jesus gives in this passage, isn't there? When you pray. When you pray. Not an if statement. Not like, maybe you should try this. When you pray. And he walks through this whole thing of what that is supposed to look like. What somebody who has an active prayer life, what it looks like. See, that word when has to do with the direction, doesn't it? Think about that. When. Well, that, that means I'm going somewhere, I'm doing something when this thing takes place. So... You go to the store. It's when I go to the store. That's how we speak that. That's how we say that. It's when I'm going on a trip. When I'm going. It's something future, but, but there's a direction to it. The other thing about this word when is, is interesting to me is it's, it's out of necessity, isn't it? When. I have, a, I have an intention to do what I said I was going to do. See, I, I don't just go to the store. I don't just go on vacation for any random reason. There's an intention in what I am doing. When I pray, there's direction and intention. Well, direction. Who's our prayer towards? Help me. Come on, I know you know it. Who is our prayer towards? God. That is the direction of our prayer. When you pray, do you have intentionality in it? Three of you that know how to pray? See, that's the point of the teaching today is because many of us think we, we don't have a complete understanding of it. Direction and intention is when. When you do this, this is what it's supposed to look like. Jesus starts off by saying... Don't be like the hypocrites. How many of you are a hypocrite? Nobody raising your hand. I got one. That means the rest of you are lying in church today. Come on. See, he says, don't be like them. See, we like to think of that word hypocrite as it's everybody else who doesn't do what I do. The problem is we are all hypocrites if you think about it in terms of God. We're all hypocrites because why? We're not living to the standard that God has set before us. If we're not living to that standard, we are living as a hypocrite. We call that being in sin. We are all hypocrites. But this picture of what Jesus is saying is the word hypocrite is pretender. Do you pretend when you come to church? Do you pretend when you live out in the world? This idea of pretender and where it comes from is this Greek idea of, of a play being put on, okay? This play, and there's a person who's there and they have a mask up. And while they have this mask up, they're in character. But it's the same person, when they put that mask aside, they pick up another mask and put it up. Something different, a different character. 
This is what it means when we say the word hypocrite. It's this pretend thing that we're doing. It's this fake persona that we are putting out there. Don't be like the hypocrites. In essence, Jesus is saying, don't be a pretender when it comes to prayer. Write that one down. Don't be a pretender when it comes to prayer. And he gives us a few characteristics of what that might look like. Number one, you're standing on a street corner. That's what, that's what the word says. What's the other one? And this one's going to smack you in the face this morning. It says, in the synagogue. Uh-oh. Oh. Okay, okay, let me help you. Church today is like the synagogue of old. Do we stand up in church services and pray? We, we, we do. But see, that's why we have to be cautious and finish the sentence. The sentence says, because the purpose of the pretender is to what? Be seen by others. The purpose of the hypocrite is to be seen. That's why they're on the street corner. So everybody who's looking at them thinks they're righteous and good. The same can be done in church services. Is when we are the pretender, we feel like we have to stand up and, and just pray something. Because what's our motivation? So that we are seen by everyone else to be righteous, good, and holy. See, the motivation of the pretender matters. Jesus isn't saying don't get up in service and pray. Let me be clear on that. Don't offer up requests unto God. We know that. But what he is saying is what is the motivation for you getting up and praying in service? What is the motivation for you to come up and say, well, I have a need, God. I have a request. Can the brothers and sisters in Christ join with me in this? Are you doing it to be seen as righteous? Are you doing it out of this sense of obligation? I have to do it. I, I have to because, because people need to know that I'm a good Christian. You feel that? Have you done that? That's why it's the challenge. Don't be the pretender. Because I would say to you is that's what we think when we see that happening at times, even in our services. When somebody stands up and they pray, we think they must be religious. Right? We're being honest. We think this. Uh, they must be strong in the Lord. See, we also would look into their prayer and go, well, I can't pray like that. They're, they're more holy. They've they got, they got a better connection with God. And see, what we don't get to do is judge that first and foremost. Okay, but What we need to be cognizant of and careful of is that when we stand up, when we share, when we pray, that our hearts are aligned with the heart of God. And not to be seen as righteous. Even if somebody says, great prayer. That's not the motivation. The motivation is that we want to come into alignment with holy God. And so, have you ever been in a small group prayer meeting? Not just in service. Have you, have you like gathered with a couple people and prayed? We, we did that this morning before service uh, with some of the diaconate. See, the pretender does feel obligated. All right, okay. How many of you have ever felt obligated to pray? Come on, let me be honest. You felt obligated to do it because everybody else around you was doing it. So it's like, if I don't, they're going to judge me. That's what the pretender does. And Jesus says very clearly, don't be like the hypocrite. Don't be like the pretender. Stop faking it. See, that's the, that's the phrase that I think in my generation I've heard, and maybe you've heard it too, though, is you fake it until you make it. Right? If, I, if I, I just make it seem like I know what I'm doing, then everybody will come alongside and say, hey, it looks like you know what you're doing. And then eventually I get to the finish line at some point in time. So I fake it until I make it. No, don't do that. 
Don't fake it. If you're not in a spiritual, healthy place, in a prayer circle, in a prayer meeting, you're the one that needs prayer. You don't have to offer up prayers in like this hope that somebody's going to, well, they think about, no, don't do that. Maybe you need to say, I need prayer today. That's what the group is for. It's that humility before a holy God and before others. The bottom line simply is this. Do not be a pretender. But what should you do instead then? If I, if I don't get to be this pretender, well then how do I develop a proper prayer life? What does that look like? Or let me say it this way. How am I to ensure that I'm being authentic before God. What does Jesus say? Well, where do you pray? He says, go into your room, shut the door, and pray in secret. That's the title of the message, isn't it? Secret prayer. Well, wait, why should I do that? Why should I go in to my room and pray because p public praying is wrong again no that's not what Jesus is saying here see the pretender will pray to be seen rather than have their hearts fully tru or truly aligned with God and we don't want to be the pretender so something has to develop in us and where is that best done in private well, that doesn't make sense I should be able to practice in front of everybody Yes, and we'll get to that. But if for you to develop a proper prayer life, it says do it in secret, because in secret is when your character develops. In secret is when nobody is looking at you to even give you praise about what you are doing, where the, the, I almost said where the magic happens. No, it's where the relationship gets deeper. It's where you know you are in the right and proper place with a holy God. It's in the secret. It's in the quiet place. See, I can be authentic in secret because I don't want to share a lot of stuff that's going on me in public. I don't want them to know they might judge me. But I can do that in secret. In secret is where you learn more and more about God. So yeah, we can come to service every week. We can share and we can worship and we can pray. But it's in the secret that it becomes personal. It's this intimate moment with the holy God that I have. It's in this secret place. It's the place where you can't show off. Right? Don't be the hypocrite. Don't be the pretender. In the secret... Your prayer life gets developed because no one else is around. It's in the secret that you pray in order to develop the right heart. So when you do pray publicly, you know you're in the right position. Practice in private and allow the secret silent moments of God to develop you further. Where your relationship can grow deeper and deeper, more intimate with holy God. That's where you develop the proper prayer life. In the secret place. Well then the question becomes, how do you pray? See, we all, we all think there has to be some order to it. And there, and there does, maybe. Well, what does he say? He says, don't do this again. So now we need to pay attention. What is he talking about? Don't heap up empty praises like the Gentiles do. And I would just say this. How many of us are Gentile today? That should be all of us. Every hand should have been in the air unless you are Jewish. And I apologize. <laughs> I've had that happen before. I, seriously. It says, don't heap up empty praises. And what came to mind in reading that passage was what is found in 1 Kings 18, 20 to 40. This is the battle between Elijah and the prophets of Baal. And I want to read you this to give you an idea. It's, it's, it's the idea, though, that the more we speak, the more we chant, the more we 
try to say the same thing over and over again, God hears us better. Listen to this. 1 Kings 18, 26 to 29. This is part of that story. It says, And they took the bull that was given them, and they prepared it, and called upon the name of Baal, morning until noon, saying, O Baal, answer us. And there was no voice. No one answered. And they limped around the altar that they had made, and noon Elijah mocked them, saying, Cry louder, for he's God. Either he's musing or relieving himself, or he's on a journey, or perhaps he's asleep and must be awakened. What did they do? They cried aloud and cut themselves even more. They kept going on and on and on and on and on. And as midday passed, they raved. But there was no voice. No one answered. No one paid attention. We know Baal's a false god. We understand that. But what are they doing? They're trying really hard to get this fake god to to them over and over and over and over again. They're chanting it. Hear us, answer us, please. And I caution us because I think a lot of times we get in that mode ourselves. We think if we speak it several times over and over and over again in the moment that God hears us better. No, no, no. We serve a God who hears us when we call. Not how many times and how often and write the right words. No, he hears us when we call. 1 John 5, 14 to 15 says this. This is the confidence that we have in approaching God. If we ask according to his will, what happens? He hears. That's, that's the confidence we have. We don't have to chant this thing over and over again. God, I really hope you're going to come through this time. God, I really hope you're going to come through this time. God, I really hope you heal me this time. I really hope. That no, no, no. We ask. And God hears. We have confidence that he is listening to his children. As Proverbs 15, 29 tells us, the Lord is far from the wicked. He hears the prayers of the righteous. He hears us. And I just challenge you a little bit. Are you righteous before a holy God? Yeah, we're, we're repented. I'm a sinner. Saved by grace because of the blood of Jesus Christ that we're going to celebrate later. I've taken on the righteousness of God through Jesus Christ. So yeah, when I pray, I have the confidence to know that God is listening to me. And Jesus even spoke of this. Matthew 7, 7 says, Ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened to you. There's a confidence even in that. Jesus is saying, ask me. Do it. You don't need to chant like everybody else is chanting. You don't need to be wishfully thinking that somebody's, that God's going to come through for you. No, you can ask with a confidence because God hears us when we call on him. So we confidently what? Ask God for our desires and needs. Confidently. Boldly. We confidently seek God for our desires and needs. We come to him. We confidently let our request be made known to God. That's what Paul says in Philippians 4, 6. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, finish it. It's not any more complicated than that. We don't have to go on and on and on. Does that mean we don't pray often and daily? No. It means in our moment we are confident in our request. Today I'm praying this way for this thing. I don't need to go this way, this thing, again, 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 again in the moment. But can we ask tomorrow? Yeah, absolutely. Can we ask the next day? Yes, absolutely. That's not the same thing as standing there and God's not doing something in the moment. And he, no, he's not answering. No. God hears us when we call on him. So then what? So we're, we're developing in the secret. We're not chanting it, but we're boldly proclaiming it and coming to God in prayer. But then Jesus tells, says, this is how you should pray. Familiar to us. But I'm going to read it. Pray then like this. Our Father in heaven. Hallowed be your name. 
Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts. And we also have forgiven our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. That is pointed and straightforward if I've ever heard it. It's not some big elaborate thing that we have to do before. No. We get to come to God, our Father, and just pray. This thing is like six verses, seven verses long. Does that mean we don't pray the way we do often? No, but it, it, it's an example for us. That's the point. Jesus, He's teaching his disciples. Let me say this. How many of you are a disciple? Okay. For the rest of you who didn't raise your hand, it's if you're a follower of Jesus, you're a disciple. It's because we're learning from the master we're learning from Jesus. And so as he's teaching them how to do it, it doesn't mean if you do something different, it is wrong. But it's our example before us. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Notice that he's not, Jesus isn't saying, Jesus, hallowed be your name. And I, I, and I jokingly say that to a degree because Jesus is the one speaking and here in this moment, he's not calling himself God. In this moment. Yes, we know and understand that Jesus is God and he speaks of that elsewhere. But here, Jesus, in his own prayer life, this is how he addresses who he's or the direction, the when he prays, where it's going. Our Father. That's how Tom prays. Father God, oh, I often pray that way. Father God, that's, just, that's not because of this specific, but that's, we're understanding there's this direction. It's God, Father, yes. It says, hallowed be your name. Basically put, your name is holy. What do we know about holiness? It's set apart, it's different. It's not like anything else that we experience or see. It's God, Father, your name is Holy. And so we need to understand who we are addressing. That's the point of what Jesus is teaching. Who we are addressing with our prayer. And that simply means you have a relationship with the one you're addressing. How many of you have... Never mind. Thought that, that squirrel just left. Never mind. If we don't know that God is the one we're addressing, we are not in relationship with him, which means we haven't repented of our sins, which means we don't understand that we've been bought by the blood of Jesus Christ to bring us into that relationship. We need to know and understand with confidence that, yes, we pray to God. His name is holy. Know who you are addressing. Have a relationship with the one you are speaking to. He says, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth and heaven. Wasn't that the mission of Jesus? Think about the story of Jesus. His mission was to bring heaven's kingdom here on earth. Or the way Jesus said it, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. This is what our desire is, is that the kingdom of God would invade the kingdom of this earth and out of these buildings that we sit in weekly, that God's name would be proclaimed to the generations. We want that to happen. So for us to say, your kingdom come, your will be done, as a part of our prayer, it's an acknowledgement of that. That our desire is that we want God's kingdom. We don't need a presidential kingdom. I know that just hurt somebody. I'm sorry, but it's true. We don't need a presidential kingdom. We don't need a, a kingdom of the United States of America. No, we need the kingdom of our God. That's what we believe. That's what we do. That's what we understand. It's the kingdom of our God. And not just in heaven. In heaven is where God's dominion and his authority rules in certainty forever and ever. But we want it here on earth. We want the kingdom of our God to be here on this earth. How does that take place in work? Through each one of us. Did you track that? Why does it work through each one of us?
because we are all believers in Jesus Christ. We all know what Matthew 28 tells us. Go into all the world and preach the gospel. Baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Teaching them to observe everything that I've commanded you. Surely I'm with you always through the end of the age. We know it. And so that's our desire for it. That's what's birthed in us. Your kingdom come. We, we need help doing it. Amen. We need help. Me just going on out into this world while well, willy-nilly, no plan of action, doesn't help people become saved. God use us as, uses us as vessels for his glory. Amen. We need help. Help God bring your kingdom here on earth because every other kingdom that gets set up doesn't work. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. What's that? Well, how many of you know God provides? If you know God provides, doesn't this sound a little demanding? Give us this day. Think about this. What happened to the people in Israel? They, they come out of Egypt. The book of Exodus talks about this whole thing. It's where manna literally falls from heaven. The bread of heaven. Jesus becomes the bread for us as the new bread from heaven. Side note. But this bread, this daily provision of need gets met. Jesus would talk about it in the Sermon on the Mount. He says, look at the birds. They don't even need how much more will your heavenly Father care for you? See, this is, what, this is not a demand. This is an understanding that the promises of God are the promises of God. So when he says, I will provide for you, we get to stand in that assurance of it. It's not give us this day. No, it's give us this day because your promises are your promises. Take care of me because your promises are your promises. Watch over me because your promises are your promises. You will provide. What came to mind just now is even when Abram was supposed to sacrifice his son Isaac. There was a ram in the thicket. And, and Abraham says, the Lord provides this is the idea. It's the confidence to know that God will always come through. But I will say this, it might not look like you expect. It just might not. We get things twisted in our own mind, but we have to know, we have to understand, and we have to stand on the promises that he will provide. Forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. How often do you ask God for forgiveness? Ever? Maybe once? See, this is, this is not the salvation prayer. Let me, let me ask it this way. How many of you mess up on the daily basis? Right. How many of you get it wrong more times than you'd like to admit? Right. Right. This is before a holy God. And so going to God and saying, God, I messed up, has nothing necessarily to do with your salvation. It's an honest admission that you were wrong before God. This is why it's way easier in the secret place to do that. God, I got it wrong today. God, I messed up today. I treated them really poorly today. God, forgive me. See, this is more in line... I, well, the second part anyway, it says forgive us our, or also as we have forgiven our debtors. This, that section then is in line with Mark eleven twenty five. 25. It says this, it says, whenever you stand praying, forgive. If any of you have anything against anyone, so that your father were also, who also is in heaven may forgive your trespasses. The basic point is this, is so we recognize that we have been forgiven. That's the point of the first section of prayer. Yeah, God forgives, we have been forgiven. But unlike that servant who goes before the king and bows down to him and says, I can't pay the debt, and the king forgives him, and then he goes out to his fellow servant, 
What happens in that story? He throws the other servant in jail for owing him something. No, we don't want to sit here and be people of bitterness and unforgiveness. So as a reminder here, Jesus is teaching. He says, since you've been forgiven the great debt that you have, forgive others. Turns it over and he says, Do, pray for that, that you forgive others. <laughs> forgive them. Don't hold a grudge against them because that's one root that... Hmm. God wants to pull that root out of your life. He wants to pull that bitterness, that grudge, whatever, out of your life because that is not the right way to live in the kingdom of God. I know we like to, to hold on to things. It's safer when I do that. No, you're more bitter when you do that. Freedom comes when you let it go. When you are able to ask God to help you forgive or to forgive others. So yeah, what we're going to celebrate here is that we've been forgiven. That's the importance of the remembrance. That you have been for every wrong that you've ever committed in this life and for the ones that you do on the weekly basis that you all admitted to. I messed up. I didn't get it right. Allow me, God, then, the grace to be able to let go of this bitterness, to be able to forgive other people. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Let me ask you this, does God tempt? The answer is no, for those of you who didn't, weren't sure. No, God doesn't tempt you. James 1, 12 to 15 tells us this, Blessed is the man who remains steadfast under trial. And when he has stood the test, he will receive a crown of life, which God has promised to those who love him. Watch this. Let no one say he is tempted. I am being tempted by God, for God cannot be tempted by with evil, and he himself tempts no one. God is not the one that tempts you. It doesn't mean the trials don't come. God allows trials to take place, but he doesn't bring the temptation of how we act in that place. See, this is more in line with what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 10, 13. No temptation has overtaken you that is not common to man. God is faithful, and he will not let you be tempted beyond your ability but with the temptation, he will always provide a way of escape. God will allow the temptation or that moment of temptation to happen in your life. He's not the one that is tempting you. The trial is there to help you grow and change and be different in God's kingdom. But what, what Paul does tell us is that in the temptation, there's a way of escape that only God provides. Just as an illustration... I know we have little kids here, so I'm going to try to be nice about this. How many of you get tempted on your phone to look at something inappropriate? Don't raise your hand. All you young people I know, I know you're excited to raise your hand sometimes in church. No, no, no. But think about that. In that temptation, is there a means of escape? There always is. A lot of times, though, we give in to the temptation instead of walking away. i got to keep going. i got to make sure that I, I know what's going on. Everybody else's life. I'm guilty, okay? I don't stand up here saying that I don't do that. I do that. But the point is, is through the temptation, God's the one that provides the escape. He doesn't tempt us. He doesn't lead us into the temptation. He might lead us into the trial. See, even think about Jesus. He was led into the wilderness by the Spirit. That's God. God's leading Jesus as the man into the wilderness. He's leading them into the trial. He's not leading them into the temptation. See, the devil comes and is the one that tempts Jesus. It's a different picture. So even Jesus himself wasn't led to be tempted or in temptation by God. He was led to be tested. See, God will not tempt you, but will always give you a means of escape for it. That's the end of the prayer, isn't it? That's where the quotations kind of end. 
Well, there's another verse there, too, anyway. For if you forgive others your tr- their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. That points back to Mark eleven twenty five, doesn't it? It's not part of the prayer, though. I want you to see that. And the reason I want you to see that is because we end our prayer. For thine is the kingdom, the power, the glory forever. Amen. See, King James has that in there. Most other versions don't have that in there. And I'm only pointing this out for a simple reason. Is that we have to be cautious. Okay, this is a side topic for today. Be cautious when you hear something or when you practice something a certain way. Because if it's not found in Scripture, you might be doing something completely wrong and terrible. Might be. Does that mean the the ending that we, the benediction that we put on the end of the Lord's Prayer is wrong? No. It's not wrong. It's not the point. We could could have literally ended it any other way we wanted to. And if you want more history on that, I have it up here, but I'm not going to go into all of that history. But my point is simply this, is that humans like to twist things and, 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 and contort things for personal gain a lot of times. So we like to inject our own opinions into things, say this must be the word of God. No, no, no. If it's not aligning itself with scripture, I would be very cautious. So what should we do? We allow it to come in, but we go back to the word of God to see how it aligns with the word of God. That's how it works. So this could be anything in your life. Because we believe that the Bible is our both our guide in both in matters of belief. So is that what, what part of our covenant? And practice. So if it's, if it's not there, we might need to rethink of what we're doing. But, but it doesn't invalidate the ending of that prayer. But I would say to you is Jesus didn't care how the prayer ended. He wanted to teach them something specific. What did he want to teach his disciples? That God is holy above all. That's what he wanted them to know. I don't care how you end it. See, because we also know in Jesus' name we, we ask, right? It's in Jesus' name. So that's why we end most of our prayers in Jesus' name. But it's the recognition of, of God being holy above all. He wants to rec- us to recognize whose kingdom works best. We already said the kingdom of our God is better than any kingdom here on earth. It works best. He wants us to recognize, he wants the disciples to recognize whose will works best. We know that oftentimes we try to do things in our own will and our own strength. It doesn't go well. God's will works best. Jesus wants his disciples to know where provision comes from. Do you understand that? It comes from God. But ultimately, and finally, Jesus wants his disciples to seek forgiveness and to forgive others through the process. This is what he is teaching them through this simple prayer. I said ultimately, but finally, then he wants them to recognize that while trials come, God's not the one that's tempting you. God is not tempting you to sin. He never will. The enemy will. But not God, but he also will give you a means of escape. This is what Jesus thought was important to teach his disciples. How many of you are disciples? Everybody's hands up. So don't be like the hypocrite in your prayer. Don't be the pretender in your prayer time. Don't fake it until you make it. Don't go around chanting in the hopes that God will hear you better. He always hears us. Be confident in that. Now, the outcomes might not go exactly how we want, but be confident that God is listening and understands. In fact, Jesus says the Father knows what you need. But it's in the secret place, and that's how we're going to conclude. It's in the secret place where all of this prayer life develops. It's not in the church service. It's not here. It's it's what you do in private that matters most of all. Because if you can't pray in private, there's no way you're ever praying out in public. 
right? There's no way that that happens because you haven't developed your prayer life. So how I want to conclude today is that we pray the prayer Jesus taught us as an example of what it means to come before a holy God, recognizing what we recognize, his kingdom come, his will, all of these things, as a declaration of faith this morning. So will you join me as we do? Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.